Mr. Thompson, carry on. Thank you. I'm, I'm ripping out pages of my script, Your Honor. Well, maybe I shouldn't interrupt you then. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right. Uh, Professor, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the aftermath of Prop 8 and some of the conduct of supporters of the LGBT community and what, if anything, the relationship is to the political power of gays and lesbians in California today. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, tab 79. This is an article in the New York Times. Uh, it's dated February 8, 2009, uh, and it starts, for backers of Proposition 8, the state ballot measure to stop single-sex couples from marrying in California, victory has been soured by the ugly specter of intimidation. Some donors to groups supporting the measure have received death threats and envelopes containing a powdery white substance, and their businesses have been boycotted. Professor, when the general public reads in the New York Times about the ugly specter of intimidation and death threats and envelopes containing a white powdery substance, does that dissipate the ability to, uh, uh, for the LGBT community to appeal to the norm of fairness? Um, within limits. Uh, that might be the case. Um, so if your suggestion, Mr. Thompson, is that the already weak political position of gays and lesbians has gotten weaker, I may be inclined to agree. Um, that said, I think we have to take into consideration the role of things like boycotts. So I would not equate boycotts with death threats and intimidation. Um, there are a host of extra... Um, extra electoral or non-electoral forms of political participation which have regularly been turned to by people who were excluded from the political system and boycotts is one of them. So for example, it's difficult to imagine the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s without the Montgomery bus boycott or the boycott of um, white owned businesses in, in certain southern towns. Indeed, uh, we can go all the way back to the late 1760s and early 1770s when women of Boston arranged a boycott of English tea. So I would not group boycotts of businesses in with violence and intimidation. Um, and to the, I, I, of course, I don't know the details of this article, but to the extent that uh, isolated acts of inappropriate behavior have diminished the political power of gays and lesbians, that may well be true. Um, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2525. Same objection as the other exhibits, Your Honor, object uh, relevance to the hearsay and cumulative. Very well, well, we're... And, and, and one more other thing, Your Honor, this is after the election. Witness has been examined with respect to the contents of this document, and it's being admitted with that purpose in mind, and so I think it's... Uh, it's appropriate. But well, do you have any more questions on this line? Uh, on this line, I, I do, but uh, feel free, Your Honor. <laughs> well, it just occurred to me, uh, um, since Mr. Thompson is exploring this subject, uh, Professor, have you considered what the effect was on the political support for the civil rights enactments of the 1960s of the uh, riots and vandalism and other acts of uh, illegal and inappropriate behavior that occurred <clears throat> at that time that was associated with, if not the civil rights movement, nevertheless uh, associated frequently with African Americans uh, and in that particular period. Have you considered the effect of those events on the political climate and um, the subjects that you're opining about? Um, not specifically, Your Honor, in, in part because um, I was asked to evaluate the relative power or powerlessness of gays and lesbians, so... Um, I realize that you haven't uh, considered that in connection with your expert report here, your expert testimony here, but have you considered that in the course of your professional endeavors? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as a general rule of thumb, 
uh, any forms of organized violence or, or even just broad disorderly behavior um, certainly has a negative impact on uh, the um, public opinion surrounding the plight of the individual. Um, there is, in addition to it being a somewhat uh, um, effect, historically effective um, tactic, nonviolent protest also plays much, much better as a, as a PR item. Um, however, I think we would be wrong to discount entirely uh, whether or not uh, these acts, which are usually quite spontaneous, um, may not in fact serve the long-term interests of the group. So for example, I'm thinking of the, of the riots in Los Angeles following um, the verdict of the, of the Rodney King um, um, debacle. Um, those riots set into motion um, a, a process called Rebuild LA, where there was substantial investment in really blighted um, and underserved and, and underutilized communities in Los Angeles and city and county uh, that may have, in fact, not come about were there not the spontaneous uprising. I'm certainly not defending the actions, Your Honor. Um, I think that, that that's, in the long run, less likely to be productive um, than more likely. Uh, but there are, there are moments where, where those sorts of acts are interpreted by some portions of the, of the perceiving public as a cry for help or an expression of frustration or maybe uh, sort of the ultimate expression of powerlessness. Well, and is there a possibility that the acts that Mr. Thompson has been referring to in his cross-examination might have the same effect in connection with the issues that we're discussing here? Um, so I, I, I'm a, a little uh, concerned about making that leap uh, for a couple of reasons. So uh, the first is that the most recent act Mr. Thompson talked about took place after the election. So um, we have to differentiate effects on the election outcome versus effects on the relative power or powerlessness of gays and lesbians. Uh, the second thing is we would want to weigh those, those incidents against the converse. So um, we had sworn testimony uh, in this courtroom by Mayor Sanders about his house being vandalized, by uh, Mazia about her being subject to harassment. Uh, in fact, the Heritage Foundation report, which was introduced into evidence, makes no attempt to gather um, evidence of intimidation, vandalism, hostility, violence in the opposite direction. So the Heritage Foundation report, I frank frankly find a little bit intellectually dishonest. Um, we also know from the hate crimes reports that there were more than 100 acts of violence against gays and lesbians in 2007. I, I don't know the number for 2008. Uh, we know that uh, nationwide, gays and lesbians are more likely to be targeted for violent attack, rape, and murder than any other American on the basis of their identity. Certainly that would also be weighed in the evaluation of whether or not the public perceives the group sympathetically or hostily, um, and we would want to consider both of those things. Very well. All right, Mr. Thompson, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. If you wish to follow up, you may certainly do so. Uh, well, and, and let's follow up by, by looking at the next uh, tab 81 in your binder. This is an LA Times story, uh, and it recounts uh, what appears to be a boycott against a, a restaurant in Los Angeles, El Coyote, but if we look at uh, the third paragraph under the picture box. It's the one that starts, a boycott was organized on the internet with activists trashing El Coyote on restaurant review sites. Then came throngs of protesters, some of them shouting shame on you at customers. The police arrived in riot gear one night to quell the angry mob. Now when the police are called to quell an angry mob, uh, would you agree that that's taking a boycott too far and that that sort of conduct uh, could have negative effects for the political power of the group you're trying to support? Um, certainly as it's represented in this LA Times story, um, Mr. Lopez appears to have a flourish for uh, expression. I don't know how angry the mob was, how mob-like their behavior was, or whether or not any arrests were made. Um, as far, I, there, there's no, I have no basis to judge what the actual actions were in front of the restaurant. I just know that 
you know, a bunch of people showed up, maybe yelled, and the police were called, which might have been a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do to, to calm, to calm uh, passions. Um, so I, I can't, I can't conclude about whether or not the, there was activity that went quote unquote too far. Um, I, I have to tell you, I actually don't have a particular problem with a boycott of uh, a, a business managed by uh, someone who contributed to an act that disadvantaged a significant share of his or her own customer base. That seems, um, well, in, in some of the same language you're, you're using uh, to ask about gays and lesbians, it seems sort of counterproductive to the cause of the business's success. Um, so I actually don't have a problem with the underlying boycott. Clearly, if people behaved inappropriately, if the police made arrests for violence or whatever, that, that was inappropriate and not helpful to the cause of gay and lesbian uh, political interests. And uh, let's uh, turn to, oh, well, Your Honor, we, we would move the admission of DIX 2528. Very well, 2528 is in, admitted. And turning to, let's skip a few tabs and go to tab 84. Uh, this is, again, a story in the Los Angeles Times dated February 16th, 2009, and it, it states, a classroom dispute at Los Angeles City College in the emotional aftermath of Proposition 8 has given rise to a lawsuit testing the balance between First Amendment rights and school codes on offensive speech. Student Jonathan Lopez says his, his professor called him a fascist bastard and refused to let him finish his speech against same-sex marriage during a public speaking class last November, weeks after California voters approved the ban on such unions. <clears throat> when Lopez tried to find out his mark for the speech, the professor, John Madsen, allegedly told him to ask God what your grade is. The suit says. Now, I'm not asking you whether any of this is true or not, but when people read this type of story in the Los Angeles Times, would you agree that it has the tendency and the, and the potential to diminish support for gay and lesbian political power? As I, once again, Mr. Thompson, without speaking to the veracity of the, of the recount of the incident, um, Adverse publicity is negative to the interests of the group to whom it pertains. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2533. Very well. And um, now you talked a bit about hate crimes uh, yesterday. What makes the bias crime distinct from a traditional assault is that it is the person's membership in a particular group that is the reason for his or her selection as a victim, correct? Uh, that's correct. And it is that group membership and that group that is the actual target of the crime, correct? That's correct. The assailant is trying to create within that community a sense of fear that engaging in a normal discourse of human activity is not available to them at that location, correct? That's correct. Your Honor, we'd like to uh, at this point publish uh, on the screen DIX 2544. It's a short interview that Bill O'Reilly conducted with uh, someone who went to the Castro after Prop 8 and was assaulted. Well, the Supreme Court says it will hear challenges to the vote against gay marriage out there, which is no surprise. The courts do want to impose gay marriage on America. There's no question about it. As you may know, uh, since gay marriage was voted down in the Golden State 16 days ago, there have been many clashes between protesters and some Christian groups. Now, last Friday in San Francisco, 21-year-old Christine Cloud, a Christian missionary, says she was physically assaulted by a man. Ms. Cloud has filed a police report and joins us now from the city by the bay. So I understand that you're in a group down there, I guess about 12 people, uh, Christian people, evangelists, and you go, you go down to the gay neighborhood and you play music and you try to engage people in conversation. Is that what you do? Yes. We've been going down to the Castro for the better part of three years now. And we go down there and we play worship music. And if people want to talk to us, we'll talk with them. And if people want prayer, we pray for them. And we've been going down there for the better part of three years. Now, do, do you set up shop on the street, actually on the street? Yes, on the corner of 18th and Castro, that is where we play music. All right, now, 
you don't stop people though. You don't try. They, they can walk by you without you trying to stop them or. or yes, that's true. Okay. We don't. We we don't stop people. All right. So if they want to talk to you, you're there. Um, and your your mission is to do what? What do you want to do down in this group? Our mission is to share the love of God and to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you trying to convert people to be straight from gay? Are you trying to do that? No, we are not trying to convert gay people into straight people. But we are down there to tell them about Jesus Christ in hopes that they would have that revelation. Now, you go down there and you know after uh, the gay marriage is voted down, a lot mm -hmm. of people are angry, but you still go down. You still, yes. You're still going down there now. Um, yes, that's true. And then some guy comes over and roughs you up. How did that happen? Well, we were we decided going down that we were not going to instigate conversation. We were not going to open air preach. We wanted to be sensitive to these people, so we were just singing Amazing Grace. We were actually in a circle, holding hands, singing Amazing Grace. When a man walked up to our group and he picked up a Bible that was sitting that was sitting next to me, and I approached him and I said, "Sir, could you please give me back my Bible? That's one of ours." And he turned around, he said no, and he hit me upside the head with the Bible, knocking me to the ground and began to kick my legs. Wow. Yeah. Now, were the police there? Did they see that? Yes. The police took him into custody, and they came up to me, and they asked me if I wanted to press charges against this man. And I said, no. Tell him that I forgive him. And then you, but you did decide to fill out a police report. We had to I, have that to make sure that your yes. account is true, and you, and you did, and we saw it, right? So what happened there? Yes. I did decide to fill out a police report just so that there's a record of what happened. Now, do you know this guy? Did you talk to this guy afterward? Did, did, was there, did you try to reason with him at all? No, I didn't know this man, and I didn't try to talk to him afterwards. The police suggested that I didn't. That I didn't talk to him, so. Did they, they take let him, him in? Did the police take him into the police station? No, they did not take him into the police station. They hmm. escorted him out of the Castro. So he assaulted you, kicked you, hit you with a, in the head with a book, the Bible. The mm -hmm. police didn't arrest him, even though the police saw it. That that seems strange to me. Well, it was because I believe because I didn't want to press. No, I know, I know. But if a policeman witnesses a crime, you don't have to. He saw it. You see what yeah. I'm talking about? Well, actually, I don't know if the police actually saw it, but they were called and came to came to where we were okay now um are you going back down there i mean what had you process this whole thing well it was it was traumatizing and i don't know if we are going to go back but at this point we're going to use wisdom because we know that it is a politically charged yeah situation. i mean i think you got you have to let things cool down a little bit yeah, i mean we want course. you to be safe i mean you seem like a nice young lady and we certainly don't want you to get hurt but emotions are running high um, yeah, that's true. You know, the Christian uh, tenet is turning the other cheek, and it looks like you did that here. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, it would, was there any sense of, let's see if it were me, I would have got up and, you know, what I would have done. <laughs> um, but you turned the other cheek, Miss Cloud. I did. I, well, my, my desire is that they would not feel like they're condemned or unloved. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming on, and please stay safe. Uh, Thank you. Take it easy, you and your group, for a couple of weeks, all right? Uh, professor, does that... A number of Mr. O'Reilly's questions were leading. Professor... Does that incident, if true, and I'm not asking you to opine on whether it's true or not, but would that fit your definition of a hate crime in that it, wasn't, it was a targeted crime that was meant to send a signal that a certain type of person wasn't welcome in a certain location? Um, it may actually fit my definition of a hate crime. I'm a little bit hesitant because there is uh, there is the danger of yelling fire in a crowded theater. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, provocative acts um, are, are are problematic. It, you can imagine in a racial and ethnic environment, for example, if um, an uh, if an African American uh, approached uh, an Anglo and said. Uh, you racist bastard, you're, you're evil or whatever, and then uh, the person attacked him, that African-American would not be able to say that that was a hate crime because there was a provocation in, involved. And, and so I guess I'm a little reluctant. 
uh, the 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 entire incident strikes me as sort of um, I, I'm not even sure how to comment on it, given that it's it's not a news report. The police didn't witness it. I, I just I don't know what to make of that. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX two five four four. Very well, and can we move on, Mr. Thompson? Y y yes, Your Honor. Um, I just have uh, one more document on this line of questions. Um, and that's, uh, we'll skip to tab 89. Uh, and Professor <coughs> Secura, this is uh, a document <coughs> from Time Magazine uh, entitled, uh, it's November 15th, 2008, What Happens If You're on, the, on Gay Rights Enemies List? And um, it says in the second paragraph, the Mormon Church is not the only group being singled out for criticism. African Americans, 70% of whom voted yes on Prop 8, according to a CNN exit poll, have become a target. According to eyewitnesses, reports published on the Internet, racial epithets have been used against African Americans at protests <clears throat> in California, with some even directed at blacks who are fighting to repeal Proposition 8. Would you agree that when people read this sort of story in Time magazine, it reduces the ability of the gay and lesbian community to appeal to the norm of fairness? As I've repeatedly testified, Mr. Thompson, any time there is adverse publicity surrounding a group, it will diminish their abilities to make claims in the public. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2531. All right. Very well, and you are moving on, are you? Yes, Your Honor. Now, so a new, a new topic, uh, Professor, we've talked a lot about California now, and I want to switch gears and talk more about the national political scene and ask you a few questions about that. And let's skip ahead, if you have no objection, over many tabs to uh, 96D. And this is um, a story from uh, 1993 from the Los Angeles Times. It's DIX. 2587, um, and um, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, the bottom of page two, where it says at the bottom of the page, in 1992, the big story that it was, was, was that it was the year of the woman, says Dwayne Garrett, chairman of Dianne Feinstein's Senate campaign. But in California politics, I think the emergence of strong public widespread gay and lesbian support was a critical difference in close races. I don't believe that any politician seeking statewide support in either party would be foolish enough to ignore the potential support of the gay community. I think the days are gone when you can run, even for a nomination of the Republican Party, bashing gay, gays and gay lifestyles. And was that uh, an accurate statement in 1993, do you believe? I believe that it was inaccurate in 1993, and it is even more inaccurate today. Your Honor, we would move the admission of uh, DIX 2587. Okay. Very well. And then uh, turning to uh, the next tab, which is tab E. This is an article by Howard Feynman. Uh, he's a respected journalist for Newsweek. Is that right? The journalist for Newsweek. Um, I, I assume his level of respect is high. Okay. And turning to uh, the bottom of uh, page one, it says, in Springfield and Washington, not to mention New York, Chicago, Atlanta, San Francisco, and especially Los Angeles, homosexuals are a powerful and increasingly savvy block. And would you agree uh, that the homosexual political movement is savvy? I'm sorry, I don't see where you're speaking, Mr. Thompson. Uh, you... It's the bottom of page one uh, behind tab E. Do, do you see the, the story, uh, the final story? I mean, what the paragraph begins with. Uh, oh, it starts, gay power is going traditional at lightning speed. And sorry, I was reading the very last sentence, um, which is a carryover. Uh, I, I believe that that is a, a a journalistic sort of anecdotal take. I think um, I would not have agreed with this take in 1993, and I would not agree with it today. Well, let me direct your attention down to the uh, on page two to the second full paragraph, 
second sentence from the end where it says, gays and lesbians, in fact, have become a key source of new funds for sympathetic Democratic candidates nationwide. And do you agree with that statement? Um, I don't. I think that gays and lesbians are uh, donors uh, to Democratic candidates in certain parts of the country. Uh, I, I would be shocked if there were substantial gay donations, for example, to Democratic candidates in most of the Great Plains, uh, um, most parts of the Deep South. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what basis this reporter is making this claim, but I would not be willing to make a similar claim. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2586. Sure, I, I object in terms of relevance. We're back. Very well. Uh, 2586 is admitted. Okay, let's, Objection overruled. let's skip on to uh, tab G, uh, and it's called, this is a story in Time magazine called The Gay Mafia That's Redefining Liberal Politics. And it's in, uh, dated uh, Friday, October 31, 2008. And it talks about, uh, if you turn to page two, the third full paragraph reads, uh, in part, among gay activists, the cabinet, and it's referring to this group of wealthy donors. Have you ever heard of the cabinet? Um, I'm, that's a new one on me. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, is a revered as kind of a secret gay super friends, a homosexual justice league that can quietly swoop in wherever anti-gay candidates are threatening and finance victories for the good guys. Rumors abound in gay political circle, circles about the group's recondite influence. Some of the rumors are even true. For instance, the cabinet met in California last year with two sitting governors, Brian uh, Schweitzer of Montana and Kathleen Sibelis of Kansas, both Democrats. I isn't it true that uh, wealthy gay donors are able to get attract the attention of lawmakers nationwide? Or I've just, uh, on Vegas grounds, and that's the phrase attract the attention of lawmakers. I'm not sure what that means have meetings with high-ranking uh, officials uh, throughout the country? Um, uh, I think it would be fair to say that when uh, there is money to be given, there are politicians to come accept it. <laughs> That's one thing we can agree on. <laughs> and we, and I, I would move the admission of DIX 2590. <clears throat> Very well. Um, 2590 is admitted. All right, now let's move on. Uh, at the national level, you would agree the political opportunity structure is better than it was five years ago, correct? Um, I would say that it, the opportunity structure is probably marginally better because of the distribution of controls in the chambers of the, of the legislature and the presidency. Uh, now let's turn to tab 99. And my question is, uh, is HIV funding an important political priority for the gay and lesbian community? Um, it is, yes. All right. And then turning to uh, pages 12 and 13 of this document, which is uh, DIX 1337. It's a, a Congressional Research Service report for Congress. And you can see on page 12, it shows the level of funding which started in 1982 at $8 million and uh, is uh, well over $20 billion today. Um, and isn't it true that uh, this reflects a measure of success that the gay and lesbian community has had in having uh, funds allocated to HIV? Um, uh, Mr. Thompson, you're going to have to forgive me, but I, I'm deeply troubled by the notion that this constitutes a success. Um, it could just as clearly be evidence of the number of individuals infected with a life-threatening disease. Well, if we so look... As the number has continued to climb both in the United States and worldwide, the level of funds that the U.S. government is dedicated to, to uh, fighting and treating the disease uh, or preventing it has gone up. Um, Perhaps gay and lesbian political interest advocated for this. I would assume that they did. Um, but in the absence of knowing what the monies are spent on, and in the absence of knowing what other interests might have played a role in securing them, um, some of this money could be going to foreign aid to Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa where HIV infections are high. I, I just, 
I don't know what the money is being spent on, so I can't draw political conclusions on the basis of the table. All right. Uh, Your Honor, we would uh, request the admission of DIX 1337. <coughs> <coughs> now, let, let's talk. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's talk about adoption. <coughs> adoption is a right uh, that a majority or even a supermajority of gays and lesbians believe they should be afforded, correct? I think that's correct. And in the vast majority of states, gays and lesbians have won that political battle and are able to adopt children, correct? I think that actually misrepresents the political reality. So a substantial number of states, um, their state laws regarding adoption are silent on the question of whether or not unmarried persons could adopt or whether gay persons could adopt. Some states, for example, prohibit second party adoption, um, meaning that if there's a male in place as a, a father of a child, that a second male could not petition for adoption without abrogating the parental rights of the first male because the state only recognizes one male parent per child, one female parent per child. But many of those laws predate uh, even the emergence of the gay and lesbian political movement. It had to do with split families and, and stepchildren and whether or not there could be more than, than one father legally responsible for a child. Um, so the history of the adoption regime in the United States is a history of largely silence on the matter, on the specific matter of whether gays and lesbians or unmarried persons could adopt. Some number of states in recent years have taken affirmative steps to prevent gays and lesbians from adopting or from serving as foster parents or some vague legislative combination of that, that general uh, issue. Those states would include Florida, Mississippi, Oklahoma, I believe Missouri's considered it, um, Utah, and most recently in 2008, the state of Arkansas adopted a statewide ballot initiative uh, banning adoption by unmarried persons, which had the effect of banning adoption by, by gays and lesbians. But in more than 40 states today, gays and lesbians can adopt children, correct? Uh, that's correct. Um, I, I made a prediction some years ago that um, as the anti-same-sex marriage initiative process peaked, um, as the number of states with that initiative process available left to contest the same-sex marriage issue diminished to zero, that the new um, front line would be uh, gay and lesbian adoption. Arkansas um, uh, inconveniently affirmed my prediction. I, I don't know if those things are pending in other states, but I would not be surprised to see anti-adoption initiatives appearing in the near future. Okay, now uh, let's turn to tab uh, 100. This is, uh, you, t you testified about hate crimes, correct? I did testify about hate crimes. Okay, and this is the 2008 hate crime statistics from the FBI's website, and uh, we can see that uh, there were 1,297 incidents uh, of hate crimes against uh, on the basis of sexual orientation, correct? Um, that's correct. So the FBI, um, they count hate crimes multiple ways. They count the number of actual events. They count the number of offenses that took place, which could be more or less, oh, it's more than, it could be more than the number of events because multiple offenses could take place. They count the number of victims involved because sometimes hate crimes are perpetrated on more than one person, and they count and they count the number of offenders. So some hate crimes are performed individually, and some are performed by groups. Um, so those numbers aren't always the same, but obviously they correlate very, very closely. Okay. So if we're looking at the first uh, column, we're looking at incidents. Uh, now, if we go uh, and that sexual orientation number includes hate crimes against transgender individuals, correct? Um. I don't, I don't know, actually. I, I don't see that in this table. If you represent to me that in other documents it does, I have no reason to, to dispute that. Well, and, and just to be clear, I'm not representing it was a question. I, I didn't know if you knew. Um, in, in this particular table, it doesn't specifically suggest that. Uh, now, did this category includes bisexuals, correct? Uh, it does. They represent a very small percentage of the total, but yes. Okay. And um, now if we go up a few columns, we can see uh, that the anti-Jewish uh, hate crime incidence is 1,013, correct? That's correct. And if you go to the next tab in your binder, uh, this is an abstract, um, and it shows uh, from the U.S. Census Bureau that uh, the Jewish community is 2.2% of the population in the United States. That's in the 
fourth column. Do you have any reason to dispute that? I do. You, you think that uh, what is the percentage of the U.S. population that is Jewish? Um, the percentage of the U.S. population that's Jewish, as I understand it, is between four and four and a half percent. The difficulty you're having is that this table that you presented under this next tab is actually a percentage of adherents, i.e. congregational members. Um, so it has to do with religious observance, not the number of people who could be ethnically or socially identified as Jewish. All right. Well, let's take your definition of four to four and a half percent. You would agree that there's a higher incidence of hate crimes against the Jewish community in the United States than against lesbians and gays, since lesbians and gays are four to seven percent of the population, according to you, and uh, the Jewish community is four to four and a half percent of the population, correct? Um, depending on whether, uh, you know, whose population estimates we would use, that would be plausible. And notwithstanding of the regrettable incidents of uh, hate crimes against the Jewish community, the Jewish community is politically powerful. It has a meaningful degree of political power, correct? Um, in my view, it has um, a, a fair amount of political power in the U.S. system. Okay, now, let's turn to uh, your uh, comparison of African Americans as opposed to, uh, you know, prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and, and the political power they had as opposed to gays and lesbians. Um, do you have an opinion on whether gays and lesbians in 2009 in California are better off than African Americans were before the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Um, the term better off is the rub in your question, uh, Mr. Thompson. So um, my argument would be that from a, an economic perspective and from a social perspective, it is quite likely the case that gays and lesbians in California in, in 2010 are better off than um, many perhaps even most African Americans prior to the passage of civil rights legislation. All right, and turning to uh, tab, it's, we're, it's tab two, we're starting with new numbers. Um, African American members of the United States Congress, and we've listed here the numbers uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, from 1939 to 1945, there was one, and uh, from 1945, to 1955, there were two. Do you have any reason to doubt those numbers? I have no reason to doubt your numbers. And uh, the African American uh, community was about 10% of the population in the 1950s, is that right? That's correct. All right. Um, and uh, let's then look at the comparison uh, you made towards women. And uh, turning to the next tab, uh, we can see that women in uh, in, in Congress, if we focus on the first half of the 1970s, they had between 10 and 16 members of the House of Representatives. Do you have any reason to doubt those numbers? I don't. And in the Senate, there were between there was one senator for a couple of years, two female senators from 71 to 73, and zero senators female senators from <laughs> 1973 to 1975. Do you have any reason to doubt? Uh, those numbers? I do not. And women in the 1970s were less politically cohesive than gays and lesbians are today, correct? Um, uh, I would have to actually go back and do analysis on that. I think that's probably the case. I think the partisan division among women would be much more even than it is among gays and lesbians in, uh, in, if we went back to that period of time. But um, again, without data in front of me, I'm reluctant to make, draw conclusions. Now, uh, you, you talked about politicians who make disparaging comments against gays and lesbians. I believe you referred to Senator Tom Coburn. Do you recall that? Uh, I do recall Senator Coburn. When was the last time a statewide official from California made a disparaging remark about gays or lesbians? Um, because I do not have an encyclopedic knowledge of all comments made by all statewide elected officials, I couldn't possibly say. Can you identify one? I, once again, I couldn't possibly say. I don't okay. know. So just so the record's clear, you can't identify a single anti-gay remark made by a statewide California official in the last quarter century, correct? In the last quarter century? Right. Now give me a minute. Uh, 
Um, I, I, again, I would want to I would want to be able to go and look at uh, some of the statements that were made by various members of the political system during the statewide uh, ballot contest on quarantining um, those infected with HIV um, I, and and comments made in the mid 80s. I, I just I, I I would be shocked if there were zero, but I, I, I again I just don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of everything anyone's ever said for 25 years. You would agree that it is unlikely that an openly anti-gay politician could win the governorship of California, correct? Uh, I'm not sure I, I agree with that at all. Well, wait a minute. Let's uh, look at your, back to uh, binder one, your deposition, and page 240 of your deposition. Oh, I'm sorry, which tab is my deposition under? And uh, if you'll turn to uh, 240. And line three, do you recall when I asked you, uh, here's, here's the colloquy question, do you think that in the next gubernatorial election in California that it is that an anti, an openly anti-gay politician could win the governorship of California? Mr. Goldman, objection, incomplete hypothetical, calls for speculation. Answer, no, largely because of the political distributions in the state. So this state has an electorate that is pretty significantly democratic. And, and you gave that testimony, correct? Yeah, I, I did. The question that counsel asked today was whether an anti-gay politician could ever be elected. The question is Sustained. Uh, well, in the next election, would you agree that an, anti, an openly anti-gay uh, politician could not win the governorship of California? In the next election, I would consider that to be unlikely. All right. Now, let's look to trends. Uh, looking to the general public, young people tend to be more supportive of gay and lesbian rights than old people, all other things being equal, correct? Um, uh, all other things being equal, I would say that that's correct, but I, I would say that at a national level, there's pretty good evidence for substantial regional variation in that, um, but in terms of degree. But as a general principle, younger people tend to be more accepting of gays and lesbians than older people. All right, and let's turn to uh, tab, the next, tab five. This is uh, a January 18, 2010 article in the New Yorker uh, entitled, A Risky Proposal, Is It Too Soon to Petition the Supreme Court on Gay Marriage? And turning to page three of this document, in the... Uh, we need this, Mr. Thompson. Uh, I, I, Your Honor, I just... Uh, <coughs> I, I'll be done rather, in five minutes, Your Honor. Rather personally directed to your opposing counsel. And I think, uh, think it's... Uh, <coughs> your Honor, may I, at the edge of the pail. Uh, your Honor, if I may, I just want to ask him about polling data in it. That's the only question I had, um, and I'm not going to seek to move this in. If, 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 but if the court would prefer I move on, I'm happy to do so. Um, uh, l let me ask it this way: Leaving aside this document, would you agree that 58 that, that the polling data you've seen that 58 percent of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 support gay marriage, but that older Americans over 65 only 22 percent agree? Uh, the, that reports Pew Charitable Trust data. I have no reason to dispute it. I haven't looked at the data set directly. But leaving aside that particular data set, would you agree that, as a general matter, younger Americans are much more supportive of gay marriage on average than older Americans? Um, I would agree that, that, that if we took a snapshot in time and did a cross-sectional examination, that younger um, members of the, of the citizenry would be more supportive of same-sex marriage. Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to then conclude that um, as the maturation process takes place and, and cohorts leave the electorate, new courts come into the electorate, that there is an automatic supposition uh, that we're on our way to majority support. It may well be likely, actually, but, uh, 
these data don't necessarily demonstrate that. All right, one last set of questions on one last document, and it's behind tab nine. And this is an article that you wrote uh, entitled, From Radical to Conservative, Civil Unions, Same-Sex Marriage, and the Structure of Public Attitudes. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and let's turn to page 13. Uh, and it says in the first full paragraph, where does the public stand today on same-sex marriages and civil unions? And let me pause to ask you, Professor, when did you write this? Um, to be honest with you, I don't recall. It was several years ago. Um, it was presented at a 2005 meeting, so okay. in all likelihood in the summer of 2005, give or take. Okay. So, uh, Table 2 reports the results from three polls taken just after Massachusetts became, began issuing marriage licenses in the summer of 2004. As is immediately apparent, support for both same-sex marriages and civil unions has climbed. To compare these results with those reported in Table 1, we make the simplifying assumption that supporters of marriage rights would support, rather than oppose, unions in a binary choice. Comparing these results to earlier ones, the shift in opinion is frankly astounding. When you wrote that, was that accurate? Yes or no? Excuse me just a second. I'd like to finish reading the paragraph. Um, I did write that, and if you would continue reading, it would be clear I'm that... I'm going to read the rest of the paragraph, sir. So okay, uh, okay. I just wanted to focus on that part. The portion I've read thus far, is, was that accurate at the time you wrote it? Yes. All right, now I'll continue. Uh, Though support for unions topped out at 49% in Gallup's May 2003 poll, by the summer of 2004, after the event in Massachusetts, San Francisco, Canada, and elsewhere, support for at least civil unions climbed to between 61 and 68 percent in the three polls reported in Table 2. Moreover, outright opposition to all legal recognition dropped from 49 percent in 2003 and 67 percent in 1996 to a scant 27 percent by November 2004, a month in which the president was reelected in part on an anti-gay marriage platform. This represents a shift <clears throat> of 20 percentage points in four years, and as many as 40 points in an eight-year time span. While question wording, sample frame, and other factors make the results not strictly comparable, the evidence of rapid, massive opinion change is substantial. And when you wrote that, that was accurate, correct? With respect to the subject matter that I was describing, it was accurate. We have no further questions, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Boutros, you may <coughs> redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Professor, why don't we start with the article that uh, Mr. Thompson was just referring to, and perhaps you can explain your views um, relating to this sub. What was that article about? Thank you, Mr. Boutros. The article was an attempt to understand change in opinion on civil unions. Um, so the subject matter of the article was about civil unions. And specifically, um, I looked into the public opinion literature uh, to examine the impact of what happens when uh, an issue of public concern has three rather than two policy choices available to it. Because when we normally think of contestation over public policy issues, it's usually a, a pro or con position. Uh, but the gay union issue is made more complex by the presence of, of three alternatives. And so what the article was about was that once Massachusetts adopted or, or had a court um, ordered uh, adoption of, of gay and lesbian same-sex marriage rights, that support for civil unions climbed. And in the paper I speculated that in part it climbed as a strategic behavior that people opposed to same-sex marriage might support civil unions in a sense to undermine the compelling nature of the case for, for marriage equality. So uh, I think, you know, if you read the entire piece, what's astounding is the shift in support for civil unions. Now that notwithstanding, I'm perfectly happy to say that there has been a substantial increase in the public's level of support for all forms of government recognition of gay and lesbian couples, but that when, when, when the word astounding was put in there, it was in reference to the growth in support for civil unions. Do the views that you expressed in that article concerning civil unions 
affect your view today regarding the, the political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians in the United States? Well, there's certainly something I would, have, I would consider. Um, so if it were the case that the level of hostility to gays and lesbians or the level of opposition to any form of union was much, much higher, that would have a negative effect on my assessment uh, of power. The fact that it's trending in a positive direction certainly speaks well for what the future might be for gays and lesbians in American society. But as I indicated, I believe during our, uh, the, the, the first day of my testimony, when opinions change, there are sometimes ceiling and floor effects, and there's no reason necessarily to assume that opinion change is always monotonic. It doesn't have to always move in one direction. In, when you talk about civil unions, that's roughly the equivalent of domestic partnerships in California? Um, it's roughly the equivalent of the enhanced domestic partnership that was adopted in California, not the original version. Now, one of the documents that um, Mr. Thompson showed you was a press release touting the fact that Gray Davis had signed into law domestic partnership legislation. I recall. And what ultimately happened to Gray Davis in terms of his political <coughs> career in California? Gray Davis was recalled from office. Um, I, I want to turn now to the subject of um, boycotting. Mr. Thompson asked you some questions about boycotts relating to uh, those who are opposed to same-sex marriage in California. Um, have, have boycotts traditionally been uh, a tool used by oppressed minorities in the United States political history? Sure. Um, the issue at stake is if people are uh, peripheralized by the existing political processes, <laughs> Um, the tools that other groups would use to uh, sort of uh, push their case forward in the political system uh, are substituted for tools that are more available to peripheral groups. Um, as I indicated in, in, in Mr. Thompson's cross, there are uh, examples of boycotts going back even into the pre-revolutionary period uh, in the United States where individuals who felt like they, they didn't have a voice in the political system could achieve their goals through this. Uh, when you teach a course on um, American political theory, for example, uh, uh, David uh, Thoreau's On the Duty of Civil Disobedience is regularly a part of the reading list because this is a long and deep tradition in American uh, politics, and it continues even un until this day. Um, the African American community used boycotts, as I mentioned in my answer, extensively. Uh, the Latino community, and particularly in, in, this, in this state, the, the United Farm Workers Union, used a nationwide great boycott to, to good uh, uh, ends uh, in order to achieve a great contract, uh, you know, a union contract with the grape growers in the Central Valley and, and in the Coachella Valley uh, of California. So boycotts have a long and deep tradition in American political life. Mr. Thompson also raised some questions about the civil rights movement involving African Americans, and Chief Judge Walker asked you a question relating to that. Um, in, in the civil rights movement, economic boycotts were used as a means for African Americans to seek to achieve equality. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, and uh, there's some great work documenting the use of boycotts by African Americans. Boycotts are difficult to sustain. Um, in, in, in game theoretic terms, we refer to them as all or nothing goods, that they work only if there is large scale adherence to the boycott. Um, one of the strategies used by um, white um, citizens in the South to try to resist boycotts would be to um, essentially insist that their domestic help uh, go and shop at a store um, on behalf of their employer uh, during the day and the store might have been subject to a boycott and so that would create the illusion that the boycott was failing so, because African Americans were walking into the store. And one of the ways that the, um, the African Americans resisted that was that the domestics would wear maids uniforms. These are including women who had never worn a uniform in their role as a, as a domestic, would put on a uniform so that when they were walking into the store, other members of their community could see that they were not breaking the boycott, that they were shopping on behalf of their, their employer. So these are difficult things to sustain, but they can be used effectively by groups who, um, who have less avenues open to them in the normal political process. During the 1960s, um, did civil rights groups 
encourage economic boycotts of white mer merchants who were discriminating. They did. Is that in the South? That was in the South, yes. And you know, Martin Luther King preached a philosophy and articulated a philosophy that focused on nonviolent demonstrations in order to get the message across on behalf of African Americans in civil rights. Correct? That's correct. Um, were there times during the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King and others where despite those efforts to have nonviolent economic and other protests that certain members of the African American community and those supporting that community engaged in conduct that that went over into more violent activity? Sure. Uh, I would answer that in, in, in sort of two ways. The first is that it's important to remember that Martin Luther King's prominence in the civil rights movement was the result of a boycott. Um, that the Montgomery bus boycott, which was begun with the famous Rosa Parks incident, um, served as the basis for the creation of the Montgomery Improvement Association, um, and a local minister named Martin Luther King became the the chair of that. So uh, he, participating in a boycott was the basis of his rise to prominence, and he certainly didn't see boycotts as inconsistent with his, his view of nonviolent collective action. Um, that notwithstanding, there were certainly moments, there were certainly moments when uh, confronted with you know, unspeakable violence or uh, provocation or harassment that someone uh, in the black community in the South would lash out. And I don't think we would find that particularly surprising. Did it help the cause? It certainly did not. Uh, uh, did it, did it you know, have a negative impact on public relations? Of course it did. Um, and you try to weigh that against um, the other visual images that went into people's homes during that period of time. And, and the fact that um, this, in, during the Civil Rights Movement, African Americans and their supporters were engaging in economic boycotts, does that suggest to you that they, ha they were politically powerful? Um, well, I mean, as you know, uh, even in the 1960s, African Americans had at least the constitutional imprimatur of equality, even though it wasn't enforced. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, boycotts, protests, picketing are strategies used by people who are less powerful in the political system, who, for whom traditional means of political action are less productive. Are those sorts of activities, boycotts, picketing, demonstrating, firmly entrenched in our political and democratic government? Um, firmly entrenched and deeply rooted in our history. Uh, you know, uh, people recall that you know the first shots fired in the in the Revolutionary War were at the uh, at the Boston Massacre. But in fact, the Boston Massacre was English troops opening fire on a protest mob um, of of Americans who were unhappy with their their governance by the Crown. Are you familiar with a decision by the Supreme Court called NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware? I am. Um, I'd like to display um, demonstrative number nine, please. Um, and uh, the Claiborne Hardware case um, was, a, was an instance where the NAACP had um, promoted boycotting. Uh, is, that, is that your understanding? That's my understanding, yeah. Perhaps you could read into the record this quote that I have displayed from the Claiborne Hardware case. The boycott of white merchants at issue in this case took many forms. The boycott was launched at a meeting of the local branch of the NAACP, attended by several hundred persons. Its acknowledged purpose was to secure compliance by both civic and business leaders with a lengthy list of demands for equality and racial justice. The boycott was supported by speeches and nonviolent picketing. Participants repeatedly encouraged others to join in, the co in its cause. Now let's go to demonstrative number 10, which is another quote from Claiborne Hardware. If you could read that into the record, please, sir. Speech itself also was used to further the aims of the boycott. Non-participants repeatedly were urged to join the common cause, both through public address and through personal solicitation. These elements of the boycott involve speech in its most direct form. In addition, Names of boycott violators were read aloud at meetings at the First Baptist Church and published in a local black newspaper. Petitioners admittedly sought to persuade others to join the boycott through social pressure and the, quote, threat, end quote, of social ostracism. Speech does not lose its protected character, however, simply because it may embarrass others or coerce them into action. And is it your understanding that the Supreme Court found that those boycotting activities 
referenced in those quotes you mentioned were protected by the First Amendment. That's my understanding. Now, th this was a lawsuit, and um, uh, the white merchants who were being boycotted sued the NAACP, correct? That's correct. They essentially argued, they, they asserted that they were the victims because certain members of the boycotting group had, their conduct had crossed over into violence, correct? That's my understanding. And um, the Supreme Court nonetheless found that the speech activities and the nonviolent activity was, a, was protected by the First Amendment? That's correct. Do you see any parallels between the white merchants suing the NAACP and claiming that they were the victims of civil rights activity by the African Americans and their supporters? And what you heard Mr. Thompson asking you about today, the claims that people throwing eggs at a, at a window or tearing down a lawn sign uh, made the Proposition 8 proponents the victims in this matter? Um, I mean, the, the parallels are, are fairly obvious that, um, you know, acts of violence and vandalism are regrettable and inappropriate. And so we, we begin w with that, that stipulation. Um, it is not clear to me that those acts of violence are necessarily associated with the protected and indeed applauded normal political practice of interests uh, seeking redress through the, through the legislative or electoral process. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that we could fairly condemn or, or even implicate uh, the leaders of the No on Eight uh, campaign or the associated organizations with these acts that individuals sometimes behave badly and individuals whose emotions run high frequently behave badly. Uh, but uh, I don't think that that necessarily is an indictment of the entire position or the entire group. And are you aware of any literature whatsoever, political science or otherwise, that has suggested that the results of the Proposition 8 campaign which resulted in the enactment into law of Proposition 8, um, were caused by the news reports that Mr. Thompson cited to you or other news reports relating, re regarding sporadic allegations of violence or tearing down a lawn signs and like by uh, Proposition, 8, Proposition 8 opponents. Um, I don't know of any uh, journalistic suggestions that that determine the outcome, and I don't know of any academic suggestions that it would, uh, simply because the notion at some level is, is implausible uh, that some number of individuals might have been motivated by reading or seeing some of these news stories is, is possible, in fact, even likely. That the number of individuals that that would be true of would come close to the margin of victory for the proposition uh, would be doubtful in the extreme. Um, moreover, it also, it, when you think about it in terms of process, it suggests that someone who was previously disposed not to take away marriage rights from gays and lesbians changed his or her mind and decided to take away marriage rights from gays and lesbians because of an act of vandalism in Carlsbad or Fresno or wherever. So it, it just it, it, it defies credulity that one or two individuals or even you know, one or two hundred individuals might have done this, maybe. Uh, I just can't imagine that it affected the outcome. Mr. Thompson also showed you defen uh, Defendant's Exhibit 458, which is that Heritage Foundation backgrounder. That's correct. That? Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with the Heritage Foundation? I am. Briefly describe your understanding of what the Heritage Foundation is. I think the Heritage Foundation is fairly identified as an extremely conservative think tank. You review that article, or the, it's called a backgrounder in the Heritage Foundation, um, correct? I did. Were you familiar with the author of the article? Um, I, I, I wasn't when I first picked it up, but then I went and, and, and um, kind of Googled him. I just Google the verb, uh, but, I, but I don't know him directly. Someone known to be um, an expert in political science? I, I'm not familiar with his name, so um, I, I, I know many, many political scientists, and as you know, I'm the president of the second largest professional association, but I, I don't know him. And you sit on several editorial boards, like you testified yesterday, uh, in, in political science journals and the like, correct? I do. And in that capacity, do you conduct peer review of articles submitted 
for consideration and publication? I do. Does that Heritage Foundation backgrounder meet the standards that would qualify it for publication in a peer-reviewed journal? Um, it does not, and in fact, most journal editors would not even submit it for review and would return it to the author with the suggestion that it does not conform to social scientific standards and, and even provide some guidance as to how to go about fixing it. Well, could you give me a couple of reasons why it would not conform to those standards? Um, well, for starters, um, in a social scientific journal, we would want to be looking for uh, the uh, the uh, evidence gathering techniques, uh, the degree to which the evidence represented an accurate sample of the acts that took place. Um, it, there is a flaw in empirical logic called selecting on the dependent variable when as you're setting out to observe a particular instance and you only study cases where the instance occurred, you can't possibly know the causal structure because you only have the presence of the phenomenon, not the absence. So taking it into a different um, area to avoid um, getting people un unhappy. Um, imagine if we were doing a study of war and we wanted to know the causes of war. If the political scientist only looked at wars and didn't look at cases where war didn't start, we couldn't possibly know what factors lead to war or don't lead to war. In the, the local news reports that Mr. Thompson showed you concerning claims by individuals that they had been somehow harassed by Proposition 8 opponents. Um, in your view, uh, do you think that those news reports reached enough viewers to have swung the election uh, in favor of Proposition 8? I, again, I find the notion implausible. Now, um, the Heritage Foundation report, and in fact, Mr. Thompson's examination and the materials he submitted to you, did not contain any examples of violence or harassing activity by Proposition 8 um, propo against Proposition 8 opponents. Is that correct? That's correct. I'd like to just put up on the screen demonstrative uh, number 14, which is an excerpt of uh, Ms. Zia's testimony from earlier in this case. Have you, were you here for Ms. Zia's testimony? I was not. Did you review her testimony at all? I did review the trial transcript. And, and this is already in the record, so I won't have you read it, but um, this is evidence in the record that I'd like you to explain uh, in, in terms of its relevance to analyzing this question that Mr. Thompson was putting on the table, whether this, the allegations on one side and looking at those alone could somehow have any bearing whatsoever on the question of political power of gay men and lesbians? Um, once again, uh, we would want to look at the sum total of acts of violence, intimidation, and poor behavior in both directions. Uh, I, I just, e even for people who are deeply committed to their beliefs in one direction or another, I'm just uh, sort of taken aback. Uh, it, it takes your breath away to imagine someone walking up to another human being and say, you know, out loud on a public street, you're going to die and burn in hell. Uh, have a nice day. Or what's the what's the right follow up to that? I just uh, I can't imagine <laughs> saying such a thing. And that's what Ms. Zia testified, among other things. People said to her when she was out electioneering for against Proposition Eight. Correct. That's correct. Um, I'd like to turn uh, turn to uh, uh, demonstrative number thirteen which is an excerpt from Mayor Sanders' testimony. And as you'll recall, Mayor Sanders is the mayor of San Diego, where a number of the incidents that Mr. Thompson pointed to allegedly occurred. Um, were you here for Mr. Mayor Sanders' testimony? I was. And without, since this is in the record, there's no need for you to read it, but if you could generally summarize your understanding of his testimony and explain how that factors into any sort of uh, professionally appropriate evaluation of this violence factor that Mr. Thompson has, has raised? Well, well obviously this is, um, this is evidence of another uh, set of examples of um, vandalism working in the opposite direction uh, from those that Mr. Thompson identified. And again, from a social scientific perspective, if you wanted to discer discern what the net effect of these was, you would want to look at the volume in, in one direction and the volume in the other and the level of the public's awareness about it 
and the willingness of the public to change their minds on the basis of it, and only then could you conclude that it had any effect on, uh, on the distribution of votes. Now I'd like to return us to Plaintiff's Exhibit 834 at page 9, which uh, I can to save you the effort of pulling out another binder. I'll just have it displayed on the screen. Um, and I, and I'll, as a reminder, that, that, is exhi that exhibit is the LA hate crime reports. Okay. Um, and you testified earlier the, ab about that and the fact that um, the hate crime reports talked about Proposition 8. If they one do. were to try to, to evaluate in a fair, professionally appropriate um, manner as a political scientist, um, or scholar, um, would, the fa would these hate crime statistics relating to harassment of Proposition 8 opponents be something that one would have to consider? Um, page 9, please. While we're doing that, you, you, you may answer the question if you recall the, the uh, statistics. Actually, I think I went to the wrong page. I think it's the next page. Maybe the next page. Uh, uh, no. Two more, maybe. While we look for that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, sure my, my team can find it. While, while, if you could give me your views as to whether would it be necessary to consider actual hate crime statistics relating to Proposition 8 itself in an official government report if one were trying to do a fair professional study of this topic? Um, you would definitely want to look at, at hate crimes reports that are specifically related to the proposition uh, as this report's attempted to do. I think you would also want to look at hate crimes that, that took place simultaneously with the contestation of the ballot measure, even if uh, it wasn't specifically related to the proposition. And the reason I mention this is um, the literature in political science and social psychology suggests that there is a fairly close correlation between hate crimes on the one hand and the salience of the community that's being targeted on the other. For example, the Southern Poverty Law Centers documented that during the immigration debates in 2005, 2006, early 2007, hate crimes against Latinos went up considerably just simply because Latino visibility went up. Um, so I think there's some evidence to suggest that hate crimes against gays and lesbians uh, went up during the prosecution of Prop 8, even if Prop 8 was not mentioned during the assault or during the vandalism or, or whatnot. And we have now found the section that talked about the number of hate crimes, which included four violent crimes and other, other acts of violence that an official government report specifically tied to um, Proposition 8. Um, now, Chief Judge Walker asked you a question about um, the effect of violence um, on the efforts of, of those in the civil rights movement fighting for the rights of African Americans. There were several um, riots and, and acts of violence um, during the civil rights movement in the 60s, correct? There were, yes. Can you just describe a couple of examples of the types of um, violent events where things crossed over into violence, not something we're endorsing, but just a couple of examples from that era? Um, well, they range from a simple, you know, fisticuffs that might emerge in a uh, protest, counter-protest, uh, to some number of people um, in a, in a con highly confrontational situation not uh, obeying the, the nonviolence uh, plan and, and fighting back. Um, for example, we know that there was some resistance offered by Freedom Riders when they were attacked in Birmingham, Alabama. So they were getting off the bus um, and they were attacked by an angry mob and, and actually the FBI was present but, but observed it from afar and didn't intervene. Some of the bus riders apparently did fight back, though uh, the historical accounts of that are, are a little bit in dispute. That's kind of at the, at, the, at the more modest end. At the more extreme end, uh, we can think historically of, of urban riots in, in Watts and in Detroit and other major cities. In the Watts riots, something like over, I think, 34 people died. Does that sound about right? Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my 
historical recollection is just not that precise, but if you represent that to me, I, I have no reason to do that. assume that 34 people died, and, and um, let me ask you this. Was that a, was that a significant um, event of violence that um, many Americans saw on television and read about in the newspaper? I think that's fair to say, yes. Now, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that the public saw that, um, African Americans were able to, at some point through the courts and, and, and other means, achieve advancements in fighting for their civil rights. Uh, sure. So the 1968 Fair Housing Act was passed after most of the urban riots took place. Um, and I, I think it would be fair to say that the American public, while certainly not excited to see rioting, um, would sort of juxtapose that, that rioting against the extraordinary poverty faced by African Americans, harassment by the police, denied the right to vote in many southern states, et cetera, that we don't, we don't take single incidents and draw broad-based conclusions about the relative social and political worth of an entire class of, of people. In your expert opinion, as a political scientist, um, is there any basis whatsoever for concluding that the handful of incidents that have been brought to your attention by Mr. Thompson, uh, they have contributed in a material way to the lack of political power of gay men and lesbians in the United States or California? I, I think that would strain credulity. I can't see any basis to make that claim. Thank you. Um, now, Mr. Thompson also asked you a number of questions about articles and he showed you the Bill O'Reilly tape and some other materials that post-dated Proposition 8. Do you recall that? I do. And um, in, in that regard, Your Honor, I would like to um, uh, publish and play a video. It's Plaintiff's Exhibit 350, which is uh, the Gathering Storm uh, video that counsel on the other side objected to on the first day of trial because it does post-date Proposition 8. Uh, but I think the door has been opened to show what those on the other side of the, the uh, marriage debate were doing after Proposition 8 and, and disseminating publicly in order to undermine the political power of gay men and lesbians. Your Honor, this, uh, doesn't, th that video doesn't in any way relate to the political power of gays and lesbians. Um, and so we would object that this is uh, an effort to try to uh, smuggle this evidence in, even though it's been previously rejected. What does the video show? It show it's a, an, an, um, an advertisement that was put out by uh, supporters of Proposition 8 who were uh, <coughs> part of the broader campaign, which was meant to talk about um, the gathering storm and the threat to the public of uh, marriage between individuals of the same gender. And it, it's at least as relevant to this case as the Bill O'Reilly clip and the other materials that counsel played because it shows to the extent counsel was arguing that these statements and things that were happening after Proposition 8 somehow could be attributed and, and, and deemed factors relating to political power. There's a, there's a war going on on the other side that is meant to thwart the rights of gay men and lesbians as to marriage specifically. And this, this video, I think, is a prime example of that. And just so the record is clear, Your Honor, this was paid for and sponsored by the National Organization for Marriage, not protectmarriage.com. Well, I've certainly taken a um, welcoming attitude with respect to evidence in this case. <laughs> and I do think that the subject matter was raised in Mr. Thompson's cross-examination and so if this is in response to the Bill O'Reilly video, I think it's <laughs> only appropriate out of fairness to allow this uh, video to be shown. Thank you, Your Honor. If we could play that video, please. There's a storm gathering. The clouds are dark and the winds are strong. And I am afraid. Some who advocate for same-sex marriage have taken the issue far beyond same-sex couples. They want to bring the issue into my life. My freedom will be taken away. I'm a California doctor who must choose between my faith and my job. 
I am part of a New Jersey church group punished by the government because we can't support same-sex marriage. I am a Massachusetts parent helplessly watching public schools teach my son that gay marriage is okay. But some who advocate for same-sex marriage have not been content with same-sex couples living as they wish. Those advocates want to change the way I live. I will have no choice. The storm is coming, but we have hope. A rainbow coalition of people of every creed and color are coming together in love to protect marriage. Visit nationformarriage.org. Join us. Paid for by National Organization for Marriage, which is responsible for the content of this ad. Here I move admission of uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 350. I did admit the O'Reilly paper, did I not? It's in. No. Oh. Then uh, <laughs> this is, how is this numbered? This is Plaintiff's Exhibit 350. 360? 350. 350. 350 will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Professor Segura, had you seen the Gathering Storm video before today? I had. And does, does that that advertisement, um, to your knowledge, did it did it get wide distribution in 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 the United States? Um, well, I, I I read a lot about it and I saw it talked about, so I, I assume a lot of people have seen it. Um, I don't even recall exactly the circumstances under which I first saw it, but it's it's become semi-famous. Is there, um, uh, in your view, the the messages that were put out in that video? Do they relate to the balance of power uh, on behalf of gay and lesbians on the one hand, and those who oppose marriage amongst the people in those groups on the other hand? Um, it's it's hard not to look at the video and not conclude that the message of the video are, is that gays and lesbians are deeply threatening to to individuals in American society. Uh, the ominous music, the dark storm, um, one actor saying, "I'm afraid," uh, suggests that uh, that homosexuals are to be feared. Uh, there's references to children. There's references to taking your religious liberty away. There's references to uh, uh, churches being discriminated against or, 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 or facing some form of government repression. Uh, it really does present gays and lesbians as a, you know, a very serious threat to all sorts of aspects of American life. And is that, that sort of um, public message something that in your opinion uh, undermines the political power of gay men and lesbians? Um, I think it re-instantiates uh, uh, long-held prejudices about gays and lesbians. It suggests that um, gay and lesbian uh, social progress comes at the expense of other individuals in American society and, and other long-held organizations. And it makes the hill steeper. It makes the, the sledding rougher in terms of trying to uh, enact legal protections or, or to ward off um, legal sanctions. Mr. Thompson also asked you some questions about news articles and analysis of things as they stood in 1993. Do you recall that? I do. Um, can you tell us, in your view, what has happened since 1993 that, in your, your opinion, is relevant to evaluating the powerlessness of gay men and lesbians. Uh, it was interesting reading those, those um, quotes that Mr. Thompson asked me to look at because um, my recollection is that in, in, in 1990, 91, and particularly after the election of 1992, I think a lot of casual observers thought that there was going to be a really rapid period of progress uh, for gays and lesbians. And, and, and some of those statements seem to convey that, you know, that they're on the verge of really breaking through, et cetera. And I'm taken aback because, uh, of course, at the time uh, that the statements were made, this predates uh, the enactment of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It predates the enactment of the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, it predates the enactment of um, prohibitions against uh, same-sex same couples or, or gay individuals from adopting in some of the states. And of course, at that time, there wasn't a single state constitution that had been amended to establish gays and lesbians um, as uh, excluded from a civil institution. So um, in many respects, I think this is 
it sort of illustrates how a lot of optimism was dashed by the events that have occurred in the last 16 or 17 years. And, and I'm drawing a blank, but do you recall when um, Amendment 2 in Colorado was enacted that was the subject of Romer versus Evans in the Supreme Court? Was that after 1993? I think it was enacted either in the 92 or 94 election, but, but, but I'm sorry, I, I, I don't recall the exact... Um, so to, to your mind, the, the, the notion, well, what is your view of the assertion that in 1993 um, the, the rights of gay men and lesbians were on the ascendancy uh, and, and, and being protected? Um, I think those, I, I think they're, mis, they're mistaken claims. I think those are optimistic articulations by um, advocates who, who truly believe that the future was bright. Um, I think it is um, uh, harder to look at the historical record and to look at the statutory record then and now and conclude that that was justified. I think that your reference to um, Colorado's Amendment 2 um, and, and the subsequent decision by the Supreme Court is interesting because it, it um, lays bare a piece of information that's kind of missing here, which is that uh, Colorado's Amendment 2, uh, as I was asked about earlier, um, preempted uh, local legislatures and the state legislature from enacting protections for gays and lesbians uh, and added that to the state constitution. Um, and it was struck down by the United States Supreme Court. So what we really can't observe is whether there would have been other ballot initiatives consistent with Colorado's Amendment 2 that did not occur because gays and lesbians received that, that small part of judicial protection um, in Justice Kennedy's decision in Romer. Um, so, um, in, in fact, the circumstances were as difficult as the circumstances have been for gay and lesbian political interests over the last 20 years in the absence of Romer versus Evans, one would imagine that they would have been even worse. And at some point um, since 2000, have uh, issues swirling around the right, the civil rights of gay men and lesbians been used as what is known as a wedge issue in terms of political debate and elections in the United States? Um, so the, uh, the question is a good one um, because uh, it, it sort of illustrates the, the problem that gay and lesbian um, advocates uh, face. So the, the short answer to your question is yes that um, there's at least one political party in the United States who thinks that, and, and an awful lot of politicians, I should say, who think that there's electoral gain to be made from, from targeting uh, gays and lesbians for disadvantage. So um, it's clear that in many parts of the country and in many sub-electorates in all parts of the country, there is gain to be made from saying that, that you don't like gays and lesbians or you're adverse to their interests. Um, in addition, it also sort of illustrates the, the non- monotonicity, sorry, that's a fancy uh, academic term, that, that, that progress on, for any social group doesn't necessarily have to be in a straight line, that there are fits and starts and forward and backward. Uh, you'll recall in 2003 the Supreme Court in Lawrence struck down state sodomy statutes, uh, making it um, for the first time effectively legal to be gay in, in many parts of the United States. And the very next year, in 2004, 14 states adopted anti-same-sex marriage ballot initiatives, and a lot of folks credit that with, with altering the turnout dynamics in the 2004 presidential election and helping President Bush to be reelected. So um, it's very clear, to me anyway, and I think to a lot of uh, electoral studies um, scholars, that the wedge issue of gay and lesbian um, identity and, and the issues that they care about is likely to, to, to continue to be a fairly potent force in American politics for the foreseeable future. And, and back to um, Mr. Thompson's questions about violence against Proposition 8 uh, supporters, have there been instances where rights are recognized of gay men and lesbians and that has had an effect on the level of violence directed at them? Well, as I said, there is some evidence in the literature to suggest that um, favorable decisions or even the raising of the salience of the particular group is likely to attract more hostility. Uh, your Honor, may I approach the witness? I would like to uh, hand him a, an exhibit. Very well. I'm handing the 
court. Your Honor, uh, P Professor Segura, have you uh, seen this? You see what the, this document? Can you tell me what it is? In um, it seems to be a recounting of the strategic um, of the strategic approach used by uh, Schubert Flint in the Prop 8 campaign um, that was published in Politics Magazine. Are you familiar with Politics Magazine? Uh, I'm familiar with the name. I'm not a subscriber. Are you familiar with uh, Frank Schubert and Jeff Flint, the names? Um, I am. Who are they? Uh, they're paid political consultants, as I understand. And to your knowledge, did they have anything to do with the Proposition 8 campaign? I believe they were um, retained in the management or the, the implementation of the campaign. Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 398. No objection, Your Honor. 398 is admitted. Now, um, Professor Segura, I would like you to um, just briefly peruse this, but actually before before I do that, let, let's turn to the, if we could display that, let's publish uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 398, and I'd like to go to the last page, and while we're doing that, which is, which is um, page five of five of this document, and if you could enlarge the very last paragraph, and Professor Segura, perhaps you could read it into the record. Beginning, it's actually not the last, it's the paragraph that begins members of the Mormon faith. Members of the Mormon faith played an important part of the Yes on Eight coalition, but were only a part of our winning coalition. We had the support of virtually the entire faith community in California. Prop 8 didn't win because of the Mormons. It won because we created superior advertising that defined the issues on our terms because we built a diverse coalition, and most importantly, because we activated that coalition at the grassroots level in a way that had never been done before. I will represent to you, Professor Segura, that in this article by Mr. Schubert, there's no mention, no suggestion, that the handful of alleged acts of violence against Proposition 8 supporters that Mr. Thompson has alluded to affected the outcome of the election. Does that surprise you? No. Um, now, yesterday we, you t gave testimony concerning um, the, the broad-based coalition that supported Proposition 8. You recall that? I do. And you talked about some of the religious organizations, including the Catholic Church and the, the Mormon Church, and Focus on the Family and other groups that had banded together. I do recall. Um, I, will, I would like you to assume that after we were done yesterday, um, Mr. Puno, one of the lawyers for the other side, suggested that that line of testimony was somehow the product of animosity and bigotry towards religion. And I would like to ask you whether you agree with that. Uh, objection, Your Honor. This seems uh, totally beyond the scope of uh, Cross. I, I didn't ask him about... Uh, this, this subject at all. Explored at some length uh, the position of these various uh, religious organizations. Objection overruled. I'm I'm sorry. I so the idea is that that I, raise the question. Okay. Um, when you testified about the nature of the coalition that supported Proposition Eight, you weren't suggesting that there was anything bad about the religious groups involved. For participating in the political process, were you? Oh no, no, no. Um, so uh, you know, th there, there's an old saying that that you know, if you believe in democracy, you believe in the willingness to defend the other by the other guy's right to be wrong. So that that uh, whether it's the coalition in favor of Prop 8 or the coalition in opposition of Prop 8, um, people and groups are freely uh, not just allowed but encouraged to participate in the political process. And yesterday, you said that that coalition and the, some of the documents that we, you discussed um, suggested an enviable political operation. You recall that? 
I do. What did you mean by that? Um, so, um, as we walk through the documents, a couple of things um, became clear. So the first is just the extraordinary number of coordinating volunteers, um, many of whom uh, were pastors, for example, who participated in the conference call, or, or stake presidents who were um, instructed to, um, to identify volunteers in every zip code, the claim that 20,000 uh, members of the Latter-day Saints Church walk precincts two, two Saturdays in a row or, or something to that effect. Um, I think that political consultants around the country would love to have that level of grassroots buy-in and activism. As a political scientist, is it your view that uh, it is a, well, let me, let me start over. In the field of political science, is it customary for political scientists to analyze the degree of participation of religious groups in political activity? Um, it's become a growing area of research. There are a variety of experts who've become quite prominent in the disciplines through focusing on religion and politics. And um, I'd like you like to pull back up Plaintiff's Exhibit 398 on the screen and go to page 205. Have you turn to that if you have it in front of you. And go down, let's see, one, two, three. Down to the paragraph, the sixth paragraph, full paragraph that begins, our ability. Have you review that? And if you could read that into the record, that would be much appreciated. Our ability to organize a massive volunteer effort through religious denominations gave us a huge advantage, and we set ambitious goals. To conduct a statewide voter ID canvas of every voter, to distribute 1.25 million yard signs and an equal number of bumper stickers, to have our volunteer recontact every undecided soft yes and soft no voter, and to have 100,000 volunteers, five per voting district, working on election day, to make sure every identified yes on eight voter would vote. All of these goals and more were achieved. And is that consistent with the documents that you reviewed yesterday in court and, and spoke about, talking about the broad-based coalition? In my experience, it's breathtaking. Now, let's go to the next paragraph that begins, we built a campaign. If you could review that and, and read the first, the first sentence into the record. We built a campaign volunteer structure around both time-honored campaign grassroots tactics of organizing in churches with a ground-up structure of church captains, precinct captains, zip code supervisors, and area directors. Now, Mr. Thompson asked you questions about the unions and their support, financial support of Proposition 8. Um, based on your study of Proposition 8 and, and political activities of unions um, in, in the Proposition 8 campaign, are you aware of any, any similar mobilization of troops on the ground, boots on the ground, like is discussed here by Mr. Schubert, on behalf of uh, those who are opposing Proposition 8 during the campaign? Um, I am aware of some activities by Unite here and the SEIU, but nothing on this, even remotely on this magnitude. How about uh, corporations like PG&E and I think um, Levi Strauss? Is there any public reports, any scholarly work that suggests that those companies were able to mobilize their employees to go out and, and campaign and work on behalf of uh, defeating Proposition 8? in a manner that compares with the sorts of efforts we've, we've seen in Mr. Schubert's article and the documents that you talked about yesterday? Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of any um, corporations mobilizing its own employees. I would also wonder about the legality of such a thing, given that workers have some basic rights to privacy, political privacy with respect to their employer. Now, Mr. Thompson also asked you to look at the funding uh, on the, the official funding numbers for and against Proposition 8. you recall that? I do. Why is it that those funding comparisons uh, on each side that he discussed with you, both in the sort of $40 million range, um, to your mind, do not suggest that there was political power parity uh, 
between the sides in that election. So uh, campaigns have really two components to them. One is the paid component, and the other is the volunteer uh, or, or free component. Um, and uh, that level of mobilization can offset a tremendous amount of financial disadvantages, as, as any grassroots uh, politician could attest. So when I look at the rough parity of the, um, e the, economic, the financial expenditures of the two campaigns, those financial reports uh, on both sides, frankly, don't include the, the volunteer uh, our time, uh, people who are on the paid uh, on the payroll of other organizations who are devoting all or part of their time to the campaign, the rental of space, for example, for meetings that were provided by uh, coordinating organizations, et cetera. And the, the, the evidence suggests to me that the, 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 the vast volume of volunteerism, um, uh, space volunteering, um, that people on the payroll of other organizations, et cetera, that a huge amount of that favored the Yes on Aid campaign. Uh, there was a lot of people working for someone else or a lot of a space controlled by someone else that was used to organize the campaign, and none of that's accounted for in the financial disclosures. In your opinion, is that illustrative of the picture in a broader way in terms of the f forces arrayed against the gay and lesbian community in the political sphere? Well, it certainly is indicative of the breadth of their coalition. It's indicative of the resources, the manpower, and uh, the um, the net or the asset resources that they can bring without necessarily even turning to the financial resources. That uh, th these are an effect in kind contributions, but we we don't govern them that way. But uh, you know, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church or uh, evangelical churches or, or whatever, if, if you're using their meeting space, if you're using their phones, if the pastors are, uh, they're, they're perfectly entitled to do that. That's, that's part of the American process, but it, it does suggest that there's a, a great deal of resources against which gays and lesbians have to work in order to achieve their political goals. Mr. Thompson also asked you a number of questions about uh, churches and religious organizations that, that that opposed Proposition 8. You recall that? I do. Uh, you you were you were here or you were in the overflow room yesterday when when the videotape of the proponents withdrawn expert Dr. Nathanson was played. Is that correct? I was. You recall Mr. Doc, Dr. Nathanson's testimony in response to this question. I'll just read the whole exchange with the court's permission. This was on page 95 of his. 96 of his deposition. The question was, now, is it true that the religions that supported Proposition 8 that sought to ban gay marriage were much larger than the religions that supported gay marriage? And Prof Professor Nathanson answered, yes. Do you agree with him? On that point, yes, I agree with Dr. Nathanson. <laughs> and then on page 99, and this was played and entered into evidence yesterday, Professor Nathanson was asked, and the religions that supported Proposition 8 and opposed gay marriage contributed many more volunteers to the uh, campaign effort than the religions that supported gay marriage and opposed Proposition 8, correct? And Professor Nathanson again answered yes. Do you agree with him on that? Um, I do. I, I have no reason to believe otherwise, and the disparity in the demographics would suggest that it couldn't possibly be otherwise. Now, in your work on this case, you submitted uh, a rebuttal export, expert report to <coughs> Professor Nathanson's report, correct? I did. And that was, if you could turn to tab 72A in one of Mr. Thompson's binders. Oh. Rebuttal report. I'm there. And if you could provide us with a brief overview, um, and in fact, if we turn to, this is uh, marked as, uh, well, let's see, it's on page two, uh, you provide an overview of the, the points that you are um, addressing. Could you, could you give us an overview of what you opined in response to Professor Nathanson's opinions in this case? Okay, um, so uh, I, I organized my rebuttal report 
pretty much as Professor Nathanson um, organized his his original report um, for for organizational purposes to make it clear. Um, and he offers four uh, what uh, claims that he calls findings, um, and I summarize them up front, and I'll, I'll give each finding, and I'll tell you what I thought about it um, and what I wrote about it. So the first claim was that organized religion was not monolithic in its support for Proposition 8 as evidenced by opposing positions across sectarian lines. Um, and my response to him was that um, while in an extreme definition, meaning unanimity, that is true, religious persons were not unanimous in their support for Proposition 8, that the evidence he presented was actually um, sort of um, wholly misleading and, and silly. So um, he lists four religious organizations in favor and four religious organizations imposed, opposed uh, without considering the size. And, and we've just covered uh, his response to the question when he was asked in deposition. The four organizations he considered in favor um, I report in my um, uh, uh, rebuttal uh, said uh, comprised about 34% of the national population, and the four religious denominations he identifies as opposed total 2% of the national population. And in the data source I was using, one of the sects he was identifying was the Metropolitan Community Church, which is, a, which is an identified gay and lesbian religious denomination, and that denomination is so small as to actually escape measurement in the report. So. Um, uh, there's, it, there, it's comparing apples and oranges, and I thought that the, the claim was misleading. Before you, before you go on to the, the other two points to briefly summarize, were the organizations that Professor Nathanson talked about and that you were, you were discussing in this report basically the same group of organizations Mr. Thompson was asking you about today, like the, the, um, the, 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 the churches that he mentioned today in, in his questioning of you? Well, we talked about a lot of religious organizations today, but but for clarification, it was um, the Catholic, the LDS, the Baptist, and Orthodox Judaism on the one hand, uh, the Unitarian Universalists, the United Church of Christ, Reform Judaism, and the MCC on the other. Those were the the, the sects he spoke specifically about. And, sort of and the, the on the other hand would be the groups that was that was opposing supporting that, the, the op opponents of Proposition Eight. And, and just briefly, what were your other principal points in response to Dr. Nathanson's opinions? So um, the, second, the second claim he offers is that individual sects themselves were divided, um, and the evidence he uses for this is the existence of dissenter groups uh, within pro-Proposition 8 denominations. So he identifies um, uh, a dissenter group of Catholics, and a dissenter group of, of Mormons and a, a dissenter group of evangelicals, for example. Um, the, the, the problem I had with this claim was that he, he makes no attempt to ascertain the size of these groups, and there's pretty good evidence to suggest that they're very small and that they have very little influence within their churches. So, for example, um, Dignity, which is an organization of gay Catholics, was identified as a dissenter group, but, of course, Dignity is actually... Um, faced exclusion from the church. They're not allowed frequently to meet on church property in some dioceses, etc. So, it, it, again, it was misleading to suggest that there was there was a large dissenting organization and that the church was deeply divided over the issue. If you could just briefly summarize your last two points in response to those claims relating to religion. Okay, so the third was that... Um, Gay and lesbian organizations are, do not view organized religion as the enemy, and this was very much akin um, to the piece of information um, that Mr. Thompson asked me to review regarding the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, where it showed that the NGLTF was trying to engage religious leaders, and Professor Nathanson's claim was that clearly then religion is not the enemy because the gay advocacy organizations are talking to them. and. Um, that just struck me as, as bizarre in the extreme. And I, as I responded when, when Mr. Thompson asked me, uh, the NGLTF is engaging them precisely because they see religious organizations as the principal obstacle to their political advancement. So, uh, and I dealt with that in a little bit more detail. Um, and then the final point was that, um, was, was really the, the, the oddest one to deal with, which was Professor Nathanson's claim that support for Prop 8 by religious persons uh, c 
could not be fairly attributed to anti-gay animus. Um, this was an interesting aspect of his report because he defines anti-gay animus in a very, very narrow way, which is um, he says that we would have evidence of anti-gay animus if religious people acted in bad faith. Um, and I, th that's just such a, a, an unusually narrow notion of animus uh, without consideration of prejudice or long-held stereotype that I, it, it, it's almost nonsensical to respond to, but I, I made an effort. And in, in, to, to, in the interest of completeness, let me just read what Professor Nathanson said in, in his deposition in, in, that was played yesterday in response to a couple of questions. Um, on page 99, uh, or actually 102, he was asked, let me ask you a question about hostility to gay people. I'll refer to it as gay bashing. Do you believe that the teaching of certain religions that homosexual relations are a sin and an abomination contributes to gay bashing? And he answered, yes. Then on page 102, starting at line 24, he was asked the following question. Is it your opinion that primary cause of culturally propagated hostility is religious teaching? And he answered, I, that might be a complex answer. Let me start by saying that in a direct sense, yes. But I think that religious hostility to homosexual behavior in turn has its roots other than religion. You recall that testimony? I do. In, in your, your rebuttal report, the opinions you stated today, in that report and that you stated today, are the, is that, do you still hold those views or is that your opinion today? I, I still hold the views I submitted in the rebuttal report that um, by any reasonable standard, um, when we look at the array of views held by religious and non-religious people, and specifically the association of religiosity with the views on, on gay and lesbian issues, as we went through in the tables um, with his honor, um, the most plausible explanation for that is that religious views are related to the, to the actions of religious people. You know, um, Mr. Thompson also asked you a question about the, the Lax and Phillips article that it was is at tab 71. You know, I just have a couple more questions and I'll be, be done. Um, tab 71, it's uh, Defendant's Exhibit 1105. You recall that? I do. This is an article you're familiar <coughs> with. I'm sorry? It's an article you're familiar with. It is. And um, if you'll look on page 383, which is the page that Mr. Thompson quoted for, right, it's on the left-hand column, um, right above, it's, it's the um, paragraph that, right above the paragraph that begins, why might this be so, towards the bottom. <coughs> the last sentence that begins, it may not be surprising. You see that? I could do. You, could you read that into the record, and then I'll just ask you a question or two. Okay. Um, it may not be surprising that minority rights suffer when the majority is opposed to them. But our results show that representative institutions do a poor job protecting minority rights even when the public supports the pro-minority position. Is that statement by Lax and Phillips consistent with your views concerning political power of gay men and lesbians? Um, it is, with the footnote that on a number of key issues for gays and lesbians, they do not enjoy majority support. But yes, it's consistent. Let me ask you two more questions. In light of the legislative measures that provide some protection to gay men and lesbians uh, in California and, the, and some of the prominent politicians that uh, Mr. Thompson pointed you to, who have been allies in one way or another um, of gay and gay men and lesbians. Um, do you believe that gay men and lesbians still lack political power, as you've defined it? I do, and um, the 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 series of questions Mr. Thompson asked me about the statutory enactments in California. Um, and, and the number of politicians in California who, who have um, been supportive of the gay community, I think um, serve as the basis of, of his skepticism regarding um, the conclusion that I draw. 
And I would want to respond to those in a couple of ways. The first is which that, you know, I've repeatedly in my testimony suggested that we need to look across levels of government and we need to look across jurisdictions in order to evaluate the political power of the group. Um, protections afforded in, that end at the county line in a modern society are hardly protections at all. Um, and the same would be true at the, at the state line, that, that we need to look not just at the federal level or not just at a locality. We need to look at all levels of government. But more importantly, um, we, we look at a series of, of statutory enactments, some of them pursuant to court decisions, um, uh, some of them overturned by ballot initiative in, in, in several states. And when the skepticism is expressed, I, I do a, a, a mind experiment that I do with my students frequently, which is I explore the counterfactual. So imagine for a moment that I was going to write an opinion that says gays and lesbians are powerful in the political system. So I go and I survey the world and I survey the literature and I say, well, the FBI suggests that gays and lesbians are experiencing increasing levels of violence and uh, represent 70% or more of the hate-inspired murders. Could I see that and still conclude that the group's powerful? Well, conceivably, because there are other factors. Um, could I look at the, the circumstances around the country and say, well, in 29 states, gays and lesbians could still be dismissed without cause for their identity from their, their source of employment, that they enjoy no protections. Could I observe that and still conclude that the group was powerful? Well, possibly. Um, could I observe that um, even statu small statutory protections designed to redress previous disadvantages have been challenged at the ballot box over 150 times and gays and lesbians lose those more than 70% of the time and still conclude that the group is powerful, presumably. Um, could I look at the enactment of statutory, uh, excuse me, constitutional exclusion uh, and establishment as uh, excluded from a civil institution as a citizen that is separate uh, that is treated separately from all other citizens and conclude that the group is powerful. I could conceivably observe one or maybe two of those things and still decide that there's other evidence to suggest that the group is powerful. Um, to observe all of those things and to conclude that gays and lesbians have the political power to protect their basic rights in the political system would be the political science equivalent of malpractice. Uh, I, I, I couldn't possibly draw that conclusion. No further questions, Your Honor. Very well. <coughs> Mr. Segura, thank you for your testimony. You may step down. <coughs> this would be a good time to take our luncheon recess. Uh, can we resume at uh, 110? And our next witness is going to be <coughs> Mr. Tam. Very well. We we'll look forward thank to you. seeing you at 110. Thank you. <coughs>